Welcome to another teaching of Global Mission for Children and Working Faith Fellowship. We're going to be tackling a subject today that is really one of the most spewed heresies out there in the church today. It is uh, the word works. I can't tell you how many times that I've been called a work salvation heretic. And um, those of you that are living righteous uh, now, uh, you've probably been called that too. Uh, people do not understand the difference between the, the works of the Old Testament, the Levitical law, and the works of faith. The works of faith have been were before Israel. Amen. Abraham was justified by faith. We're going to get into that in the book of James. The book of James says faith without works is dead. Amen. But I wanted to read one scripture first that all these hyper grace, greasy grace, easy grace, false pastors, false teachers in the church dividing correctly today. And it's Ephesians 2. They love this verse or these two verses. It's Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Let's go to it. Please stay with me through this whole study. Get your Bible out. Get your pen and paper out, pencil, paper, whatever you got. And let's go through it. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, For by grace you are saved through faith. Hallelujah. And not that of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Yes, it is. Not of works, lest any man shall boast. The problem here is when it says not of works, lest any man shall boast. These unlearned pastors or whomever that went to Bible college or seminary that got taught wrong by the traditions of men do not know how to divide Bible verses. There are two kinds of works in the Bible. There's the works of the law, the Jewish law, the Levitical law, the Old Testament law itself to the Jews. Religious works, good deeds, church programs, rituals, ceremonies, etc. will not save you. Keeping the Saturday Sabbath, that's done away with Jesus fulfilled, that Jesus is the Sabbath, amen? We're not going to get into that study today. That's just an example. We can eat pork, we can eat shellfish. You can't do those works and get saved. They denied Jesus when he went on and did that finished work on the cross. The question is now, do you pick up your cross? You have to do your part as, uh, part as we're working together with Jesus Christ. The works we're talking about here, grace is, comes with obedience amen to receive grace you must be obedient you must obey god and his word without the works of obedience to god and his word you will not be saved you will not be saved and we're going to prove that here very quickly most hyper greasy grace teachers most false teachers do not distinguish the difference between the two kinds of works works of the law versus works of obedience and they teach that any effort at all on your part means you're disrespecting Jesus when it's just the opposite. If you love me, keep my commandments, John 14, 15. Amen? If you love me, keep my commandments. Are you keeping his commandments? Do you love him? No, we don't have to do anything. No, it's a... Mm. They just teach it. Any kind of work on your part will not affect your salvation, but only faith in Jesus Christ will save you. Some people even say that if you repent, <laughs> which is throughout the Bible, the New Testament is that's almost, it's amazing how many times repent is in the Bible. They even say if you repent, that's a work. When Revelation says uh, to a fallen church, repent and do the first works. Repent and do the first works. John the Baptist, that's all he preached was repentance. The apostles say. 2 Corinthians 7, 10 says, For godly sorrow works repentance unto salvation. It's in that order, people. Sorrow, a deep sorrow that you that you've sinned against God. A cleansing of your soul. Repent and turn from your sin. Go towards Jesus Christ. That's the second part. Go to 2 Corinthians 7, 10. Then unto salvation. One, two, three. Don't change the order, you wicked Baptist pastor. Don't try to change free will, you wicked Calvinists. When you Catholics and you Jews and you Jehovah Witnesses and everybody else that has your own works, traditions of men gospel, you're all going to hell. I pray you repent. Please. I want to read Romans 319 
to 31 really quickly, okay? Romans 3, 19 to 31. Listen very carefully. Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is, in by, which is by faith in Jesus Christ, unto all upon them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned in the past, if you're a saint, and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Now listen closely, sins past. Remember that, sins that are past. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through the faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remissions of sins that are past, not present and future, you wicked teachers, false teachers, for the remissions of sins, Romans 3.25, that are past through the forbearance of God. Hallelujah. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believes in Jesus. Stop sinning in godly sorrow. Repent. Turn to God. Then you're in salvation mode. Amen. Then his righteousness cleanses you for sins past. Let's go on to the last couple. 27, where is the boasting? Is it excluded? By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Huh. Romans 3, 27 says, there is a law of faith. No, we're not under the law. We're not under, it works, 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 works. By the law of faith. Faith has a law. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified without the deeds of the law, of the Old Testament law, of the Levitical law, that type of law. It, it clarifies it now in verse 29. Is he the God of the Jews only? There you go. They're talking about Jews. Is he not also of the Gentiles? Praise the Lord. Yet, yes, of the Gentiles also seen. It is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Now listen. Verse 31, do we make void the law through faith? God forbid we establish the law. People, the law of faith stands 6,000 years ago as it does today. Don't mix up the two laws. Don't mix up the two sets of works. It's very clear what Jesus is talking about. Amen? The moral law of God is God's own standard of righteousness. Go to 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever commits sin also transgresses the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Are you a saved sinner? Because if you are, you've just transgressed the law of faith. To break God's law is to go out of, out of the right way. In doing so, you offend, you spit in the face of Jesus, and you will be cast into hell. Amen? Please know that you will be in big trouble on Judgment Day if you think that you're going to waltz into heaven in willful sin. Under Moses' law, people could be put to death for breaking the law. Amen? But make no mistake about it. If you break the law, the moral law of God, you will not last. Amen? So again, let's go through this really closely. The works of the law. Let's go to Romans uh, 27 and 28. Again, where is the boasting? Is it excluded? By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. The law of faith. It stands. It stands. Are you standing on the law of faith? Or do you believe that this false Jesus is somehow hovering above you and only God sees Jesus, and you could be doing all these sins down here. But, oh, nope, I've been covered. I said a sinner's prayer one day. I'm a wicked Baptist. I, I'm once saved, always saved. I go to church every Sunday, but I'm wicked on Sunday afternoon, and I'm wicked on Sunday evening, and all week I'm struggling with this sin and that sin. No, 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 no. The works of the law is referring to religious ceremonies that were required by the Jews and also now are required by 
the, the, the Catholics and so many other denominations, they all have their own little laws. Ridiculous. Having to go to the temple to worship, having to keep the Sabbath, having to only eat certain foods, making various sacrifices, paying tithes, being circumcised, keeping Passovers, observing many rituals, keeping many laws, observing certain religious holidays, and following the Jewish traditions. That's what was done away with on the cross. Amen. But the law of obedience, the beautiful law of faith, I can't be faithful to my wife if I cheat on her, and you can't be faithful to Jesus if you cheat on him. Jesus came to set you free from sin, not free in sin. Amen? This is repeated over and over and over again in these false churches today. The great apostasy is here. You know, I tell people now that 99% or whatever of the churches on Main Street are not blessings. They're curses. There's itching ears that are in those churches, and they're sending people directly to hell. The practice of religious rituals and traditions are the works of the law by which no man can be saved. You can attend church for a thousand years, every single Sunday, and go on Wednesday night, whoopla, hoopla, and Friday morning prayer with the leaders, and you'll be no closer to salvation than some mass murderer. Truly. In fact, your condemnation will be worse because you proclaim Jesus. You honor him with your lips, but your heart's far from him. You can sing in the choir, teach Sunday school, pass out tracts, go on the mission field, pastor church, feed the poor, be an usher, play in the band, donate your money, rebuild church buildings, assist in disaster relief programs, participate in every single church ritual that your church has, serve in every church program, and every Christian tradition known to man. None of these works will save you. Please get this. Paul the Apostle was talking about this when he said, quote, because of the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight, in God's sight. It's the works of obedience. Amen. You must be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed. Just like you must be obedient, husband, to your wife from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep. Oh, wife, from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed. You can't cheat on your spouse and be obedient. You can't cheat on Jesus and be obedient. Amen? He gives you power to overcome. Don't be defeated. Even though it is popular, it's a popular teaching today to have no part in your salvation, don't be deceived into thinking there is nothing that you have to do to be saved. There are many actions, many things you must do, works of obedience that must be done so you can be saved. Everybody loves John 3.16. I hear it all the time. Every time I preach, oh, John 3, oh, you know, he for God so loved the world that he gave his one and all begotten son, the servant believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. It rings over and over again in my ears. Yes, this is beautiful. In times past, God loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. Amen. Praise the Lord. Nobody can take that away. That was the most glorious thing. Amen. But you must believe, number one, but hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't just read one verse, please. Read all of John 3, from 3.1 to 3.36, please. Don't just read John 3.16. Read the first verse to the 36th verse. When you're reading Bible verses, and somebody just gives you one, stop, time out, pull it out, go through the whole chapter, or at least five or ten verses back and five or ten verses the other way, okay? I like to try to go through the whole chapter, but at least five or ten, depending on your time limit at the moment. You must believe in God and his son Jesus and believe in his word. Most of our modern grace teachers stop there. They just, that's it. They read verse 316. Beautiful. They'll pull out another couple hyper grace verses too and just leave them alone. Knowing exactly that what they're doing. They've crept in and you are unaware and you've been subverted to the devil. John 336 says, he who believes in the son has every left, everlasting life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. First part of the verse, you must believe, and you must obey in the second part of the verse. Those that don't obey, the wrath of God abides on him. Do you think the people with the wrath of God are going to be going to heaven? You must obey God to be saved, people. Luke 24, 47 says, and that the remission, uh, repentance and remissions of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Imagine these fools that say repentance should not be preached. That's a work. Man, and, and you know what? Millions of people will believe that. Yeah, repentance, no works. It's right in the Bible. 
That's how foolish these people are as they wave their hands to the loud music and, and worship their pastor, the creature, instead of the creator. You must repent. This is something you must do. No one can do it for you. God will not do it for you. I'm telling you, if you continue in sin, you will not be saved. God doesn't hear sinners, John 9, 31. Only those that do his will does he hear. The only way to be forgiven of sin is to stop sinning. Amen. Remember 2 Corinthians 7, 10. Mark 11, 25 through 26. Mark 11, 25 through 26. And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have uh, anything against anybody, that your Father will also forgive you of your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. You are holding grudges against people. You have hate in your heart. Anger, strife. You're not going to... You're not going to be forgiven. Amen. You can't be saved then. John 15, 1 through 2. Let's go to it. Now listen. I am the true vine, says Jesus. And my father is the husbandman. Now listen. This is another verse that just throws away all this. I don't have to do anything. Oh, Jesus did it all. Listen to verse 2 of John 15. Every branch that is in me, every person that is in Jesus that beareth not fruit is taken away. If you are not doing the works of faith, you are taken away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Very simple. If you're not doing the works of God and you're in the vine at one point, this kills once saved, always saved too, you Baptist, Calvinist. Perseverance of the saints, once saved, eternal security, whatever you want to call it. You're in the vine and you stop producing good works, you're gone. You do produce good works, they'll prune you and you will have more to do. Praise the Lord. Two more things you must do. You must bear fruit and abide in the Lord. That is a constant, people. It's a constant. It's not a one-time sinner's prayer that you did 2, 4, 10, 20 years ago. You must constantly abide. This is something you must do and nobody can do it for you, including God. Don't believe these false teachers. I'm telling you this because I love your soul. If you are in Christ, if you're in the vine and you do not bear fruit, he will take you away, cast you in the eternal fire, which is hell, going into the lake of fire, which is eternity. Amen. It's your responsibility to abide, which means to continue and bear fruit, bear good works. Food is not church attendance or the so-called church services and contributions that are already mentioned. A new, um, it's a life of holiness and obedience to God, a life that is transformed. The old person goes into a new person. The heart of stone becomes a heart of flesh. Amen. What you used to love, now you hate. You used to watch sports all the time. These men in tights running around. Or this one, that one, trying to get a little golf playing and spending hours a week and going with your buddies and wasting all this time while 21,000 children die every day from poverty. You could care less. You go to church on a Sunday, but you got to make sure you leave church a little early so you can get to the golf tournament. Come on, people. Really? Really? Or they change the time of the service so you can watch the NFL wicked football game. Sick, sick. Your life must be radically transformed if you're in Jesus. Don't you tell me that 11 out of the 12 apostles got slaughtered for nothing and you live your best life now like Joel Osteen. You better repent. You better do that first work. You have a choice after your true repentance to continue in a relationship with Jesus, to be connected to the vine. And while connected to the vine, you always have the choice to bear fruit. If you don't continue to bear fruit, you will be cast away into the eternal fire, even though you were once in Christ. Don't let anybody fool you. Even though you're in the vine and one of his branches, you can fall away and give that gift right back to God. Nobody can take it away from you. Oh, this is true. But you can give it back in a second. Matthew 24, 10 through 13. Listen. Speaking of brethren, listen. Matthew 24, 10 through 13. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. Oh, has that happening, been happening for a while? And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. They had love. They had Christ. But now it's cold. They're gone. 
But he who's going to be saved, Jesus, let's see, Matthew 24, 13. But he that shall endure till the end shall be saved. Hallelujah. He that shall endure till the end. Not a one-time prayer. He who continues to produce good fruit till the end shall be saved. Hallelujah. And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations. And then the end shall come. People, you must endure till the end. If you don't endure till the end of your life, being faithful and obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ, you will not enter heaven. Please make no mistake about it. This is so serious. It's something you must do. It's an action. Faith is being faithful, as I said before. No one can do it for you, and God won't do it for you. It's your choice to endure or not to endure. Often people start out very sincere and repentant. I did. I was miraculously saved from drugs and alcohol and pills. And, I mean, I'll tell you. Six months later, I fell hard. I had bad teaching. Nobody really taught me about abiding in the vine. Oh, you'll get better, Jimmy. Don't worry. Oh, you went back to drinking. But, you, you know, you're still only drinking two days a week and getting drunk. But you were, you know, seven days a week. Oh, no, I wasn't even told the truth. Don't listen to the false messages about grace and once saved, always saved. And unconditional eternal security and perseverance of the saint that's right from the pit of hell from satan's mouth he said it in the garden didn't the serpent say hey Eve, do it sin god told you not to do it it's all throughout his word now people but in the garden god told Eve, don't do it and the serpent said ah don't worry you'll surely live no problem that's what these false teachers are telling you calvinists baptist catholic all the other ones they're telling you, they're, they're feeding you with lies and you're eating it up. Let's see what the word of God says. Matthew 16, 24 to 26. Jesus said to, to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it and whosoever shall lose his life shall find it. If you're not losing your life, if you're not have enmity with your family and your old friends and maybe have to change your job because it compromises the word of God, if you're not hated by all for his name's sake, you're not with Christ. If people don't say, that guy, Jimmy, he's radical. He's in some kind of cult. He takes this Jesus thing too far. Oh, that 2,000-year-old book, bleh, he, times have changed. Blasphemy. You'll go straight to hell if you think that. Wake up, people. Wake up. Mark 16, 26 says, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You're going to keep your friends, your family, everybody happy. Go on these big trips and spend all this money while people are dying and people need to hear the word of God and people need to be ministered food and medicine and water. But you don't care. You need to go on that $3,000 trip every year. Blasphemy. You're saving your life. You're going to lose it. What does it profit you if you shall gain the whole world, says Matthew 16, 26, and lose your own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? A couple vacations every year? Trip to that wicked Disney world? Hey, come on, guys, wake up. You must deny yourself and take up your cross. Many people are going to get mad at you. Your cross is a place of suffering, rejection, persecution. Pain, tribulation, a loss of sinful worldly pleasures because of repentance. You know, people always say, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Go to a stupid attraction in Kentucky to see a stupid ark spending $500,000 or feeding the poor. You can teach all that stuff to your young children right from your house. Going to take a billion dollars away from people in the next five years, that stupid ark exhibit. Oh, but it's good. No, it's blasphemous. Your self-denial is required of you. Or you cannot follow Jesus, even though you may attend church and do all these good things. Mother Teresa appeared to do a lot of good things, and she's burning right in the pits of hell now. She died telling Hindus and Muslims they can go to see Jesus just the way they are. She has it in writing not long before her death. Wicked, wicked, wicked. Let's look at the way grace saves us through faith. Titus 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men 
teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, denying un denying sin, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Did you hear that? We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Are you living righteous? Godly? Are you just a saved sinner that messes up all the time? You're not righteous or godly. Titus 2.13 says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. No works, no Jesus. Titus 2.15 says, These things speak, speak righteousness, speak godliness, speak good works and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anybody despise you. They'll hate you, fine. Somebody, some man lets their wife dress like a prostitute, rebuke them. Just watch out for the left or right hook, that's okay. Wants to cut your head off, hey. You gotta tell people the truth. Do you care about their soul? So God's grace, uh, God, uh, grace is God's unmerited favor. It's far more than we deserve. This year, it's unmerited favor. It has appeared to all men. But it's not some covering of our sin, as some have made it out to be. But it's, in fact, instructing us to deny ourselves of sin in this present age. Don't say we won't be perfect till we get. Matthew 5, 48, be perfect. As my Father in heaven is perfect. Is that a lie? Is Jesus tell, asking you to do something you can't do? Since the wages of sin is death, then the grace that instructs us, uh, then for grace to instruct us to not sin by telling us to deny ourselves of ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly and godly in this present age. That means today, that means now. It becomes clear how grace saves us. Hallelujah. It saves us by instructing us to turn away from what is going to kill us. It's very simple. Sin and selfishness and pride and etc. And to turn towards the one who is going to save us, Jesus. Hallelujah. We need Jesus. Amen. We're not replacing him with works. That's the Catholics. We'll deal, we already dealt with them. When we obey the instruction sent from his grace to us. Sure, we don't save ourselves. But Jesus will save us when we give him our whole heart and obey him. And obey his grace. And obey his truth. This is the grace of God. Not the Baptist grace, not the Catholic grace, not the Pentecostal grace, not the Charismatic grace, not the United Methodist grace, not the Lutheran grace, not the Jehovah Witness grace, etc., etc., etc. It's not any man-made grace. It's the true grace of God right from the Bible, right from Bible verses. Don't let these man-made denominations fool you. The unmerited favor of God to send us his word and to write the law of God on our hearts. And to instruct us to turn away from sin and the ways of this world and the false religion of Christian works. Hebrews 11, 1 through 8. Now faith is a substance of things hoped for and evidence of things not seen. For, it, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the world were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. You remember that? Abel gave God his best. Cain still gave God a sacrifice, but it wasn't his best. Oh boy. That was right at the very beginning of the Bible, people. A lot of faith has been from the beginning. If you're just giving Jesus 99%, and you're not giving him your best, which is 100%. You're going to go the way of uh, Cain. You're going to go the way of Cain. By which he obtained a witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts and by, the, uh, by it being dead yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Wow, hallelujah. Hey? And was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that pleased God. Listen, Hebrews 11, 6 says, By, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Let me make this a little bit bigger. My notes are, can barely read it in the first place. By faith, it's not impossible to please him. 
For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You must be diligently seek him. Don't just give him half. Don't just give him three quarters or 99%. Give him all you got. Amen. By faith, Noah, being warned of God's things not seen as of yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Hallelujah. By the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out in the place which he should, after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. He went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith, Abraham did works of righteousness. If he didn't offer up Isaac, he'd be in big trouble. Amen. God bless them. You must exercise faith. Faith is action you take when you believe. Faith always does something. It's an action. It's to be faithful. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness because Abraham obeyed God. Abraham did something. That's faith. It's action. It's works. Faith always obeys. Without obedience, there is no faith. The works of obedience is the manifestation of faith. Remember John 3.36. He who believeth on the Son has life, but he who does not obey the Son not only does not have life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Don't have the wrath of God abiding on you. Obey Jesus in every area. So to believe in Jesus without obeying Jesus keeps one under the wrath of God. You don't want to be there. Yet the American church today is filled with people who say they believe in Jesus, yet their lives are virtually no different than before their conversion. The same divorce rate, the same drunkenness rate, the same fornication rate. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's sad. James 2.14. I told you we were going to get into James. What does it profit, my brother, and though a man say he has faith and does not have works, can faith save him? The obvious answer is no. Faith has Faith that has no works of obedience is a kind of faith that it does not obey the instructions of God, which is grace. You obey God, you receive grace. You disobey God, his wrath is on you. You see where it goes? A faith that has that no action, no obedience, no life transformation, no repentance, no cross that you're bearing, no biblical fruit, no abiding, no overcoming, no self-denying, no Christ-like character. To be Christian is to be Christ-like. First John 2, 6. If you're going to walk like him, I mean, if you're going to uh, say that you're with him, you need to walk like him. Otherwise, you do not have a love of God. And faith will not and cannot save you if you is not accompanied by obedience and works. That's just a mental belief in Jesus. Remember, the Bible says the devils believe in trouble. You believe and you probably don't even tremble in his name. James 1.20 says, yet said, James 1.22 says, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. If you're not a doer of the word, then you're not of the faith. Millions of people attend church. Billions of people attend church each week and are not doers of the word. Neither do they seek God, God nor study his word. I remember the six years I was deceived. I don't think I cracked my Bible two or three times the whole six years. Much less did I obey him from my heart. I was a saved sinner heading straight to hell. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my father, which is in heaven. No works, Jim. You're, you're preaching the works up. No one shall int Matthew 7, 21. Not everybody that says to me, Jesus, I believe in you, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven, will enter the kingdom. Yikes. No works. No obedience. You must do something. He who does the will of God will get into heaven. Just to believe in your mind will not save you. I pray that you get this. You must do the will of God. You must overcome sin and be uh, overcome sin and be conformed into the image of Jesus. This will cost you something and everything, your whole old life. Only Jesus can save you, and He has conditions. God's love is conditional. I've done a study on that. Check it out. A couple days ago, it is not enough that you accept Jesus. Jesus must accept you, and it's conditional. Praise the Lord. He will not accept you if you do not give up your life completely to follow him wholeheartedly. I like to use the 99% rule. I can't go throughout the day and do 99 things right and then 
lied to my wife, am I going to get into heaven? I can do one sin every day and get into heaven, let's say. No, come on. We must deny and God in this present age. We must live holy. He, the Holy Spirit, when you get born again, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. You won't be led to sin. Amen. Watch out for these greasy grace, hyper grace teachers. They're everywhere in virtually every denomination. They're on TV. A rule of thumb, if a preacher is on TV, they're false and wicked. Just to be on one of those TBN, Trinity Broadcast System, Daystar, Church Channel, God TV, blasphemous, all of them. All of them. That's a good rule of thumb. You can't yoke with the people that own those places and get on those TV shows unless you compromise the word of God. Luke 6, 26 says, and they're all loved by all the quote Christians around the world. Ooh-wee. Luke 6, 26 says, Woe well unto you when men shall speak well of you. Isn't that the opposite what those TV evangelists speak and most people in the pulpits today? It, Luke 6, 26 says, Woe well unto you when people talk good about you. For so did their father for the false prophets. Ay, 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 you guys getting this? These teachers love to present grace to you as a covering for sin. You know why? They're going to keep you in their pews. They're not going to talk about your self-denial because you're going to hate it. You love your sin. You know it. Read John 3, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. Light came in the world and you love darkness. You love these grace teachers, these high guys. Oh, yeah, I got to do nothing. I can still compromise and go out to a bar or go here, go on that big, beautiful trip every year for 3000 and this and that. And I can still have my big car. I worked all my life for. I have to give to an orphanage or give to a widow that's dying. Come on. These grace teachers have your little itching ears tickled as they're smooth talkers. You love to hear it. Repent, please. These men are wolves in sheep's clothing and will rob you of your soul if you don't, uh, if you follow their advice. Follow the Bible's advice. You cannot continue in willful sin and be saved at the same time. Please, you cannot. Jude 1, 3 to 5. Listen, and this is what I'm doing. I, beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you shall earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. This greasy grace, hyper grace, no works, Jesus got me covered grace is a lie from the pit of hell. That wasn't what was delivered unto the saints. All the saints got their heads cut off, boiled, uh, crucified upside down. Jude 1.4 said, certain men have crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. These guys are money changers. They're grace changers. They're hateful demons, and you believe them people. Jude 1.5 says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believed not. Once saved, always saved. Having once known the Lord, and he saved them out of Egypt, but he destroyed them because they believed not. Remember John 3.36? Those that do not obey, those that do not believe. If you don't obey, you don't believe, you will be destroyed. Make no mistake about it. These grace teachers have crept in unnoticed. Live your best life now. Oh, the sports game. Oh, what are you doing this weekend? I don't care. I hope you're going out and saving souls. I hope you're working overtime to go support those that do go save souls, whatever it might be. I hope you're supporting the orphan and the widow. I hope you have pure and undefiled religion, James 1.27, and keep yourself unspotted from the world. Beautiful verse. It seems like almost no one has noticed these people sneaking in. I was deceived for six years. I've been there. That's why I'm so passionate about this. They're everywhere, as I said, in every denomination. Charles Stanley, John MacArthur, Billy Graham. Creflo Dollar, T.G. Jakes, T.B. Dashwood, Joyce Meyer, uh, uh, Paula White. These people are blasphemous. Woman teacher. My Lord, have mercy. That should be the red flag right there. Benny Hinn. Oh, these false teachers. You never see him in a hospital, do you? Saving little children from stage four cancer at three years old with the head bald and laying there two pounds. Liars. Are you false faith? Grace, hyper grace teachers, you're liars. 
Come on down here. We'll go to the hospital. We'll get those uh, uh, reports. Stage four cancer. Going to die in a couple of weeks. You come raise them. Liars. See, do you see the whole thing? That's not the grace of God. They're liars. They're filling their pockets. They'll never go to the hospital. Invite them down. I do it all the time. They're liars. They've turned the grace of God into lasciviousness, a license to practice sin. And they say you can still go to heaven in your sin. They'll put on the dog and pony show for you to keep you in their church or to keep you watching their TV show and then you go pay your stupid tithe, which goes right in their pocket to their big airplanes and big cars and come on. They teach you no matter what you do after you're saved that you cannot lose your salvation. A wicked, wicked, wicked doctrine. This is extremely false. Extremely false. Let's look at Hebrews 10. We're almost done here. Hebrews 10, 26 to 30. Let's go. For if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. But a certain fearful looking and day of, uh, fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. How much sore of a punishment do you think you're going to get? That you shall not be thought worthy who has trodden under the foot the Son of God, and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. Hebrews 10.30 says, For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongs to me. I will recompense, says the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Did you hear that? The Lord shall judge his people. He is obviously not talking about the lost person here, but someone who was once saved, who had received the sacrifice for sins, who was once sanctified by the blood of Jesus, and who once belonged to God. Mark those down, Hebrews 10, 26 to 30. He said he would judge his people. Therefore, he was not referring to the lost in this statement. You once saved, always saved doubles. I'm telling you, you need to repent fast. There's so many of you out there, and you almost got me. But hallelujah, praise the Lord, the truth is being told now. That's why I'm putting these teachings on video. The way anyone tramples underfoot the Son of God, regardless as unclean, regards as unclean his blood and insults the spirit of grace. You spit in Jesus' face when you preach and teach this. To continue in sin willfully after being saved is blasphemous and will get you to hell. This person will be destroyed in the same fire as all the other enemies of God. Murderers, rapists, in fact, there's a greater condemnation for those that proclaim Jesus but are really wicked. God will judge his people. So it is clear... How are we saved by grace through faith? It's grace that tells you not to lie or to look at porn or to cheat anyone. It is not good works, nor belonging to church, nor attending worship service that saves us. These things are good. But that in itself doesn't save you. It is Jesus who saves us through his grace that tells us how to live through faith on our own part that obeys that instruction. God does his part by sending grace to save us. and We do our part by believing and obeying, which is how faith saves us. We can't do God's part, and he will not do our part. Wolves have crept in with this easy believers and false grace that are tickling the ears and gives people a false hope as it did me for six years of being saved. I'm crying out to you. Don't believe that anymore. The false teaching takes away any personal responsibility, and to carry your own cross is thrown out. Yet the Bible commands that. Yet, they never mention that it's a narrow way and how few will be saved. Even Billy Graham went on TV saying, oh, wide is Jesus, wide is the way. Oh, man. This is the false way that leads to destruction of multiple gold. They listen, Romans 6.15. Christian, shall you continue in sin? Let's see what the Bible says. Romans 6.15 says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. God forbid if you're sinning and you think you're saved. Isn't that exactly what so many Christians are doing? Willfully sinning and saying they are covered by grace? You've been false. You've been taught by a false teacher. Traditions of men. It's really the grace of God that allows one to... Is it really the grace of God that allows you to keep on sinning just like a non-Christian? Christian? Christian? You're no different than a non-Christian. 
You just say a couple of words and you believe? How come Paul said, God forbid? Why are there countless warnings about God's judgment to the churches if it was okay to, to, to be in sin as a believer? Why did the apostles with all that ink writing about all those warnings to the churches, to the churches, to the churches? He was warning the people in the church if there was no danger. They were all once saved. Isn't it possible that God's grace has been changed to deceive today's, quote, Christian? Let's go to Matthew 7, 13 to 14. Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many go thereat. Verse 14 says, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads to life, and few find it. Few, listen, few. Most people go the wrong way. The wide gate and the broad way is what has been made easy by the false grace teachers. It sounds good and very large numbers will go that way and end up in hell. Most everybody in the professing church today is going straight to hell. Only a very small number will truly bear their own cross and suffer the cost of the discipleships and listen to the gospel that was once preached to the saints. They're few in number who are willing to seek God and obey and follow him with all their hearts and endure to the end of their lives being faithful. Luke 13, 23 and 24. You might be perplexed now, but listen to Luke 13, 23 and 24. You're not the only one. I was too when I first heard this put together like this. Luke 13, 23 says, Then said one unto him, Lord, are there only few that are going to be saved? And Jesus said unto him in verse 24, Strive to enter the straight gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able to. Many shall seek to enter in. The churches are full, but they're not going to go. They're not going to go. They have easy grace, hyper grace, greasy grace, whatever you want to call it. It's false. Jesus did not give the same answer as nearly all preachers would today. Oh, you're doing okay, Jimmy. I know you're struggling with this. You had a bad, bad life. Living. Come on. He did not make it too easy or too wide, but said to strive to enter and that the way was narrow. And many will seek to go in, but few will find it. This is very, very, very serious. Listen. What grace do you have? A grace that covers sin, excuses sin, a grace that forgives all sin even before you have committed it? Jesus died for my past, present, and future sins. No, the forbearance of sins that are past, Romans 3.25. Listen to the word of God. A grace that takes away your sense of urgency? Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Do you truly fear the Lord? Do you know he hates the wicked? Psalm 5.5, 5, Psalm 7.11, Psalm 11.5. John 3.36, write these verses down. You do not understand the love of Jesus until the hate, until you understand the hate he has for sinners. God hates the sin and the sinner. John 3.36 alone proves that the wrath of God abides on the sinner. Come on, people, come to get the real grace. A grace that takes away any personal responsibility to seek to obey and to love God with all your heart, to overcome sin, to bear fruit, to endure to the end, to forgive others, to strive to enter by the narrow gate, etc. If that's not being taught to you, you're not overcoming sin, you're going to hell. If this is the grace you have trusted in, you are in great danger of eternal hellfire. I'm pleading with you today. I'm going to post a whole bunch of Many more verses. I know we're probably over an hour here, and sadly, most people won't listen to. No, we're at 48 minutes. Praise the Lord. Well, I'm not going to go through all the other verses that I have here, um, but His grace really saves. We have a bunch of teachings that I'm going to post down here in a link. We have uh, two audio teachings called Grace and Law and Grace and Works and Grace and Works number two which includes imputed righteousness and what biblical perfection is. We go through uh, justification by faith. We go through election. We just blow Calvinism and Baptist and all those right out of the water. So please click on the link below too after you listen to this video. I say this because I love souls. Serve the Lord. Serve with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength.
Don't just give 99%. Don't be a Cain. Be an Abel. Amen? And you are able to do it if you truly repent because the Comforter will come in and help you to endure till the end. But you have to do your part. Yes, we cannot do it without Jesus. I'm not preaching that we can't. I'm not a Pharisee. I practice what I preach. Amen? I hope this was um, enlightening to you if you're not in the faith. And if you are in the faith, I hope this blessed you and that you can share it with others that maybe uh, need uh, some encouragement. Please, those of you that are in the faith, endure till the end. I want to see you on the other side. I want to see you in paradise. Amen? If I don't get to see you on this earth for us. So keep enduring. Keep loving. Remember, don't look back. Don't turn into that pillar of salt. Don't stop abiding in the vine or you'll be thrown away into everlasting fire at your last breath. Let's endure till the end. Until next time, Jesus is Lord. Thank you.